Okay, other disorders of hemostasis. And the first of these that we want to discuss is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, the idea here is that we give a patient heparin, and when we give them heparin, they develop thrombocytopenia, or a decrease in their platelet count. The reason why this occurs is because the heparin can form a complex with a molecule on the surface of the platelets called platelet factor 4. That's important to know. So heparin can form this complex with platelet factor 4, and it's against this complex that the patient can develop IgG autoantibodies. And those IgG antibodies will then subsequently result in um, consumption of those platelets by the spleen. And so that would result in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or a decrease in the platelet count because of heparin. One of the feared complications of this disorder is that patients can have fragments of their destroyed platelets be shot out into the circulation, and that would activate the remaining platelets, which would, which would result in thrombosis. And thrombosis is um, forming a blood clot within a blood vessel, which would then, of course, occlude the blood vessel and result in complications of lack of blood flow. So thrombosis is a feared complication of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. One of the important things to note um, from PHARM, going back to pharmacology, is when patients have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, we obviously have to stop the heparin, and then we'd have a continued fear of thrombosis, so we would give some other anticoagulant. And the one anticoagulant that you don't want to give these patients is Coumadin, because in these patients, there's an increased risk of Coumadin skin necrosis, and so we'd use some other anticoagulant. Anyway, that's a little bit of a pharmacology tie-in. The next of the disorders, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And the idea here is that we get pathologic activation of the coagulation cascade. Now, normally, physiologic activation would be, for example, if we had damage to the blood vessel and we needed to activate the coag cascade. This is pathologic activation, abnormal activation of the coagulation cascade. Now, the problems are going to be twofold. When you have abnormal activation of the coagulation cascade, one problem is that if you've got a blood vessel and you start activating the coag cascade, you're going to result in blocking of the small vessels, and that's going to result in ischemia and infarction within tissues. So that's one problem of DIC. A second problem of DIC is that as you begin to activate the coagulation cascade and produce massive blood clots throughout the blood vessels, you're going to be consuming platelets and factors. And so as we consume platelets and factors, then the patients will start bleeding. And they'll start bleeding from, for example, IV sites. Now, that's one place that they classically bleed from. And then they can bleed from any mucosal surface. So for example, they can bleed from the mouth, from the lung, by coughing up blood. They can bleed uh, through, the, through the GI tract. And they can, uh, for example, have hematuria, bleeding from the, um, from the urothelial line surfaces, et cetera. So th this is some examples of what happens in DIC. It's sort of like a, a yin and a yang. You get, uh, you get these clots, which then block um, the different tissues and create ischemia and infarction. And then the opposing thing is that you consume platelets and factors in the process, and so that results in bleeding in other areas of the body. Uh, remember that DIC is almost always secondary to another disease process. You don't get DIC, you get DIC because of something else. So for example, obstetric complication can result in DIC. And the idea here is that um, the amniotic fluid contains tissue thromboplastin, which is a strong activator of the coagulation cascade. And so if amniotic fluid were to leak into the mother's circulation, then that could potentially result in activation of the coagulation cascade via tissue thromboplastin. Sepsis can do it as well, and that happens in two ways. First of all, the endotoxin from the bacterial walls can activate the coagulation cascade. And second of all, in response to this infection, the macrophages tend to produce cytokines like IL-1 and TNF, and that can also activate the coagulation ca cascade indirectly. Adenocarcinoma can result in DIC, especially if it's metastatic. Again, the idea here would be that the mucin from the adenocarcinoma could activate the coagulation cascade. Um, and acute promyelocytic leukemia is another classic example. In acute promyelocytic leukemia, remember that the cells are loaded with primary granules, and sometimes those primary granules coalesce to form hour rods. That's one of the classic histologic findings for APL. Anyway, in this particular disorder, those primary granules can actually enter into the circulation, and when they enter the circulation, they can activate the coagulation cascade. And finally, a funny one but that likes to show up on examinations is a rattle, rattlesnake bite. A rattlesnake bite can result in venom going into the circulation, which can then activate the coagulation cascade. Now, the laboratory findings are relatively straightforward. They're sort of based on what we already understand. So obviously, we're going to be consuming platelets because we're making throm platelet fibrin thrombi, so the platelet count will go down. 
Obviously, we're going to be consuming coagulation factors because we're making platelet fibrin thrombi. So the PT and the PT are going to go up. Now remember that when we make these platelet fibrin thrombi, the key linker molecule that allows all those platelets to aggregate together is going to be fibrinogen. So because we're making massive numbers of these thrombi, the fibrinogen is going to go down. It's going to be consumed. And we'll also get a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Again, the idea is that in this particular disorder, some of the thrombi may be partial like this, and these platelet fibrin thrombi would then have to be crossed by the blood cell, and when the red blood cell crosses it, it'll get sheared, producing schistocytes. So we would get a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia in this particular disorder as well. Now one super high yield point here is that the patients get elevated fibrin split products, in particular D-dimer. Now remember that when you form a clot, so let's go back and remember that we've got platelets, and then the platelets are stuck to each other um, in this clot by fibrinogen initially, which then gets converted to fibrin. So let's pretend that this is cross-linked fibrin. Eventually, what happens anytime you form a clot, the really final step of forming the clot is to actually lyse the clot. Now think about this, when you get a cut in your blood vessel and you want to seal off that vessel, that the ultimate goal isn't to seal off that clot, the ultimate goal is to heal that area and eventually remove the thrombus, which was just like a band-aid as I, as I mentioned in the very beginning of these lectures. And so the, the end goal of the coagulation cascade, the very final step, is to actually lyse this clot. Now when you take cross-linked fibrin and you lyse it, the product of lysing cross-linked Fibrin is D-dimer. So D-dimer is an excellent test for, um, for DIC. In fact, it is the best screening test. An elevated D-dimer is the best screening test for DIC because it tells you that the entire coagulation cascade has been activated to the extent that you even activate the splitting of the, um, of the cross-linked fibrin. So uh, that's a very important thing to recognize, that the elevated D-dimer is the best screening test for DIC, and I've already explained why. All right, now the treatment will involve addressing the underlying cause. So you remember, DIC is always caused by something, so you want to make sure you handle that. And then you'll have to determine how to next handle the patient based on what might be going on. So you might transfuse blood products or give cryoprecipitate uh, as the need arises. The next uh, set of disorders that we want to talk about are disorders of fibrinolysis. Now, what is fibrinolysis? Before you can even talk about the disorders, you need to understand the normal. Fibrinolysis is that very end stage of coagulation that I just talked about. Remember that once you've formed that thrombus, the next thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to remove that thrombus. That's the very final step of coagulation. And um, the removal of the thrombus occurs via a molecule called plasmin. Now, the idea here is that um, we activate a serum protein called plasminogen, and we convert that to plasmin. And the enzyme that does that is called TPA, um, tissue plasminogen activator. And remember that TPA basically allows for the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. All right? And plasmin is a key molecule that's involved in fibrinolysis. Now, what does plasmin do? It does three things. Number one, it cleaves fibrin. Now, remember that fibrin is what was holding together the thrombus, and it cleaves serum fibrinogen. So it's as if it's almost trying to stop the production of any future thrombus as well. So it's trying to shut down the whole system. So it cleaves the fibrin, which is cross-linked, right? And then it also cleaves the serum fibrinogen to get rid of the possibility of forming additional clot. Number two, it destroys coagulation factors, again, shutting down the ability to form any additional blood clot or thrombus. And number three, it blocks platelet aggregation. So by blocking platelet aggregation, obviously you wouldn't be able to form additional clot. So it shuts down the ability to form additional clot and then lyses the clot that currently exists. Now, it's important to note that obviously you don't want this molecule overactive because if it was overactive, you would never be able to form a thrombus. And so we need to shut off plasmin as well and an alpha-2 antiplasmin. Alpha-2 antiplasmin is a molecule that inactivates plasmin, and that, that's written in your text as well. All right, now in disorders of fibrinolysis, the problem is that you have plasmin overactivity. 
Plasmin overactivity, however, is not occurring because you actually have a blood clot. It's occurring because there's some sort of pathology that overactivates plasmin. So when there's pathology that overactivates plasmin, there really is no clot to cleave. Instead, what's going to happen is the plasmin is going to start knocking out coagulation factors. It's going to start knocking out the ability of platelets to aggregate. And it's going to start cleaving serum fibrinogen, because that's something that it normally does. And so that's important because this disorder is going to result in excessive cleavage of serum, serum fibrinogen. Now, what are some examples? One example in which this can occur is radical prostatectomy. One thing that can happen, theoretically can happen, in a radical prostatectomy is that urokinase can be released while that procedure is ongoing. That could then activate the plasmin, and then the plasmin would then begin to uh, chop up coagulation uh, factors would begin to chop up serum fibrinogen. Similarly, if a patient has cirrhosis of the liver, the, the molecule that inactivates plasmin, which is called alpha-2 antiplasmin, which is produced in the liver, would not be produced or would be produced in less amount. And so this can also then be an example of how we could have overactivity of plasmin. Now these patients, they present the same way that you would see a patient present with DIC. So this is very important because this is the way examiners are going to go after this. They're going to give you a clinical scenario that looks just like DIC, but you're going to have to identify that it's not DIC. Instead, it's due some disorder of fibrinolysis. Now, what are the lab findings going to be? They're going to be very helpful here. The PT and the PTT are going to be up. Why? Because remember, plasmin has the ability to cleave coagulation factors, so the PT and the PTT will go up. The bleeding time is going to go up. Why is the bleeding type going to go up? Because remember that plasmin has the ability to inhibit um, platelet aggregation, so that would raise the bleeding time. But of course, the platelet count would be normal. Now remember, in DIC, the platelet count would be low because you would be using up the platelets in the formation of those platelet fibrin thrombi. And then you're also going to have increased fibrinogen split products. So the fibrinogen is going to be split and those are into products. Those are called fibrinogen split products, but there will be no D-dimer. Now remember that in this particular case, the, the disorders are not due to any form, formation of thrombus. We don't have any thrombus to begin with. We've just overactivated plasminogen outside of the uh, coagulation cascade. And so the overactivation of, plas of plasminogen, and so the overactivation of plasmin is going to cleave fibrinogen, but there will be no fibrin to cleave because there really was no clot formed, right? And so there will not be an increase in D-dimer. So this is very important because, remember, the best screening test for DIC was an increase in D-dimer. And so if a patient's got symptoms that are very similar to DIC but does not have an elevated D-dimer, you really want to think about a disorder of fibrinolysis. Now the treatment is aminocaproic acid, and aminocaproic acid blocks the activation of plasminogen so that, therefore, plasmin could not be formed. And that concludes this uh, section. The next section will deal with thrombosis.